John the Baptist's disciples came to him and said, John, Jesus is now baptizing others and all are going to him. Should we stop them? And, Jesus, and John said, no, he must increase and I must decrease. Lord, I too add my prayer uh, to what Mark has already shared with us and I just ask, Lord, that I would decrease and you would increase as we take this moment to study your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We've been going through a series on the Bible called Your Bible and You, and uh, using different metaphors in the Scriptures and looking at how those illustrate the principles of the Bible. Um, and ask, where's Toby? Can you and... Usually I, I look at Jaden, so... I'll have you guys help out in just a minute. Uh, we've gone through uh, several um, metaphors already, but this has been our key passage from 2 Timothy. Be diligent to present yourselves, approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the Word of God. Did you bring your sword? Are you holding it today, I'm trying to remember to mention it? Bring your Bible to church, keep your sword handy. Um, I think it's a good practice for us to include our personal scriptures when we worship. We want to be faithful to what we're told here in Timothy to be diligent, accurately handling the Word of God. Last week when we talked about the light of heaven, I illustrated how God brought us the Bible. I did it quickly, I realize it, and why it's problematic when God tries to directly uh, speak uh, throughout the scriptures, we see that that is a challenge. So he used a different method of uh, speaking through a prophet who wrote it down. That copy was then maintained until it eventually got translated, and then it came to the place where it's in our hands now. But how do we get it from here to here? That's that's this part called illumination, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How does God get after all of the history? And all of the work that God has done to get this here, it is of no value if it stays here. It's got to get from here to here. It's got to get from here to here. And that is the next miracle, that's the next metaphor that we're going to spend time looking at. We're going to have the kids help us today. We're going to have uh, the kids help us. So, a couple of questions to get this metaphor going. Who is told... By the sweat of your face, you will eat your bread. Who, who was told that in the Bible? By the sweat of your face, you will eat your bread. Abel, you had your hand up, and then you said, not so sure. All right, I see Benji. Come on. You can look too. Jaden's going to bring you the mic so everyone can hear. Say it in. What are we teaching these kids in Sabbath school today? I'm just a little nervous right now. Did you say Satan? That would be no. It wasn't Satan, but I, I appreciate the creativity. Anyone? Come on. I know there's only so many young people. It's Labor Day weekend. Some are traveling. All right, right here, Toby. What's your name? Say, say it in the mic. Ashton. Ashton. So who are we talking about? Judas. Not Judas. Okay, I'm going to give you a... Oh, okay. Leah or A.B.? Okay, Leah, All right, Leah. Adam. Okay, thank you. We took an academy student to get us there. I, I, I guess we're, we're getting better. Yeah, this is after sin, okay? This is after Adam and Eve. We talked about God directly wanted to come and talk to Adam and Eve, but because of sin, they hid themselves, and God has to uh, explain the consequences. Now, notice, this is, sometimes we get this mixed up. This was not a curse. Some people say, oh, when Adam and Eve sinned, God cursed the woman with pain in childbirth, and God cursed the man by having to work to bring in uh, the food. That's not what the Bible says. God cursed the serpent, and He cursed the soil. The consequences that He gave for their actions were a woman was to experience pain at childbirth, and man now had to work the soil to bring back uh, to bring uh, the bread to, to the family table. These were not curses. These, these were God's way of saying, as a result of sin, you need to understand my plan to bring redemption. Okay? This was not to just be punitive. There was a redemptive process in this. But notice, uh, God said, you're going to have to sweat. 
if you're going to get your bread. You're going to have to work for it. All right. What did the Israelites call the bread God gave them in the wilderness? Okay. Benji, you're going to redeem yourself now. I love it. Manna. Okay. He got it. All right. Benji, yes, we're doing better. <laughs> Appreciate it. They called it manna. Right? And in the same way, God did not bring that manna by DoorDash right to their tents, okay, and say it's all hot and ready, just open it up and enjoy. They had to go out and get it every single day. As a matter of fact, if they got too much, it wouldn't last the next day. It would evaporate. It would go away. It was this miraculous moment that God used this process. On Fridays, they were able to gather twice as much because God said, on Sabbath, I want you to enjoy spiritual bread. You don't need to be out there gathering the physical bread. But once again, it's illustrated. If you want the bread, you got to get it. You got to work for it every single day. This principle is throughout the Bible. Number three, fill in this passage. Let's see if any of the young people can help us out. I'm keeping an eye out. I know where you are. This is from Jeremiah. Your words were found, and I did something to them. And your word was to me joy and rejoicing in my heart. What what word is missing there? What did Jeremiah do with the word when he found it? Nico, let's hear it. Did he eat it? Oh, first off, you could have said he read it, he heard it, he memorized it, right? But that's right. Jeremiah literally says, when I found your word, I ingested it. I ate it, and your word was to me joy and rejoicing in my heart. The interesting thing about this is Jeremiah 15 is not a happy passage. Jeremiah is aware of the judgment of God on Israel, that Israel is about to go into captivity, that there's going to be a major slaughter, that all things were going wrong, and in the midst of this great turmoil, he even talks about pain that he's experiencing for the understanding of the the judgment of God. In the midst of that, he said, but I still found your word. But it was when I ate it, I'm not going to eat my Bible right now, when I ate it, it became to me joy. It it sustained me in the midst of this trial and this time period. We're going to talk about that metaphor a little bit more. Who said this? Last one, Toby and Jaden. Last question. Who said this? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Okay, Abel. Let's get some power in that black mic. We need to hear. No, come I didn't hear it. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Yes. (laughs) You are right. So John chapter 6, and and Jesus goes through a larger passage here explaining that he's he's kind of comparing himself actually to the manna here. You know that manna? That was a symbol of of my work. He says, I am the living bread. But you've got to eat this bread if you're going to live forever. Now, you see within this analogy that, that as as I mentioned last week, Jesus is comparing Himself to the Word of God, all right? He's he's comparing Himself to the Word of God. And I I mentioned uh, this reality last week, but I want to put up uh, some additional statements about how the same reality that existed in the person of Jesus Christ, that He was totally God and totally man, yet without sin, that same reality exists within our Bible. There is a mixture of God and man in this, but because of the power of God, the the man part is not in error, all right? We shouldn't be afraid of that. So a couple of statements here. The Bible, with its God-given truths expressed in the language of men, presents a union of the divine and the human. Such a union existed in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thus it is true of the Bible as it was of Christ that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So when we eat the Word, which is also a symbol of what we do in our communion service, the metaphor of eating the Lord, all right, is the internalizing of the message of God and the person of God inside of us. One more passage. The truths revealed are all given by inspiration of God, yet they're expressed in the words of men and are adapted to human need. And this fact, so far from being an argument against the Bible, should strengthen faith in it as the Word of God. Why? Those who pronounce upon the inspiration of Scriptures accepting some portions as divine, but while rejecting other parts of human, overlook the fact that Christ... The divine partook of our human nature that he might reach 
humanity. Some people say, I don't want the human part. Just give me the divine. I don't want to hear what any human has to say. I only want to hear from the Word of God. I only want to hear, you know, only God. But God works in this miraculous melding of the two because He knew that this was necessary in order to illustrate and bring salvation to us. It's for our benefit that He works through humanity to show His ability to save to the uttermost. In the work of God for man's redemption, divinity and humanity are combined. So later on there in John 6, He says, it's the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But we got to eat it. We got to eat it. Notice this metaphor throughout Scripture. Job said, I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. If I had to choose between breakfast and the Word of God, Job says, give me the Word. I'd rather eat that. Psalms, how sweet are your words to my palate, to my taste. It's the sweetest, it's sweeter than honey. Uh, by the way, that was the sweetest thing they had in Bible days. That, you know, refined sugar wasn't part of their world. It's the sweetest thing I can find, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Ezekiel, in vision, son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with the scroll. That was the book, right? He literally tells him to eat a parchment. At least I guess that's animal skin. Or no, yeah. And, uh, but he, he's told in vision to eat it, so he, he ate it. He ate it, and John does the same thing in the book of Revelation. He eats a scroll that God gave him, and God instructed him to eat the scroll. They they envision, I don't know how much God manifested the reality of these things in vision, but Ezekiel did it. He eats the scroll, symbolizing the ingesting and the taking inside of the Word of God. This is the most famous one of all. I saved it for last. Jesus, the very first temptation that he experiences in the wilderness is Satan saying, hey, make some bread. You're hungry. You're famished. You've been fasting. What's wrong? You're the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, make some bread. And what does Jesus say? It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but... How am I in the Word of God? Yes, I heard it through a variety. But on every word, every word every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And notice this reality. Jesus says it is written that we are to eat every word from the mouth of God. He equates these. If it's written and is of inspiration of God, it is therefore from the mouth of God, and every word of it is for your benefit. Every word. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So if we're going to have a vibrant spiritual life, we need to be eating our bread. Now, the analogy of bread is wonderful. Some people get really deep into this, and they say, oh, first God has to grow the grain, and that symbolizes the work of, and then you've got to harvest the grain, and then you've got to mill the grain and turn it into flour, and then you've got to add salt and oil and yeast, and you've got to knead the dough, and then you've got to let it, I mean, they get really into it, and that's fine, by the way. That's a fine, and now, if you want to, you know, you can take these things too far, of course, all right, but I guess uh, suffice to say, I think it's clear and it's illustrated throughout a variety of Bible passages that it does take work to obtain the Word of God. It does not just drop into your lap. If you think that you can just scan through a passage, just read it briefly and say, I now have the ultimate nutrients of, of the life of the Scriptures in my, in my experience, I don't think you're taking it seriously. If you want to really appreciate the Word of God, it takes work. It takes study. It takes effort because the blessing is found in this was God's solution to sin. When he told Adam, by the sweat of your face, you're going to need to bring in your bread, it was God saying, this is the plan of salvation. You're a sinner now. If you want to be redeemed, you need it. Now, not that we're saved by works. Let me be clear, okay? God is still the one that does it, but he creates the conditions by which we can appreciate his work of salvation for us which is the work that it takes to obtain the bread. Bread is a mixture of God and man. It is God who makes the wheat 
All right, we didn't make it. The, the, the sun and the rain and the miracle of God makes it grow. But man has to take it and process it and put it in the oven and make it grow. It is a mixture of the blessings of God that he provides and our ability to transform that blessing into the meal that we're about to eat. It takes process and patience. It must be broken down. Notice many times when it says that they ate bread, it says they broke bread together. All right? The bread must be broken down. And then you put it in your mouth and you chew it. You're breaking it down. And then it goes into your stomach and it's further broken down before it can feed your body. Okay? Thus it is true as we study our Bibles. This isn't just about bread. This is an analogy of how we understand our Bibles. It takes work. It is a mixture of us working with the Holy Spirit that God would lead us to a proper understanding. There's a process to it. Sometimes it takes patience. Okay? It, takes, it must be broken down in order for us to, to feed the body. So these are all benefits to the study of the Word of God. It's not meant to inhibit our ability to understand. Some quick principles. Now, you can go and read different books and see that you can have 10 principles, you can have 20 principles. William Miller is famous for his 14 principles for Bible study, and they're all fine. They're all wonderful. They can get really theological terms like hermeneutics and exegesis and, and inductive Bible studies and things like that. That's fine, but I'm going to keep it a little bit more simpler for today's purposes. I'm just going to offer five basic principles if we want to really appreciate the bread that is the Word of God. First of all, what do you do before you eat? Don't we always pray? Do you you always pray when you eat? We should. We're supposed to give thanks, okay? Even if you're at McDonald's by yourself, all right, you can still pray as you knock the straw, the wrapper off the straw, Lord, bless this meal, hallelujah, and then you can eat, right? We should always pray before we eat. It is the same thing before we, it's not the same thing, it's an even greater thing that we pray before we try to digest this meal. Prayer is essential. It doesn't need to be a 45-minute, you know, tears and agony type prayer, but just, Lord, as I open your scriptures, I realize without your guiding light, without your Holy Spirit, this is not going to be a successful journey for me. Bless me now as I read your Bible. You should always have an attitude and a focus of prayer when you study God's Word. It's the same as before we eat. Give thanks. Thank you, God, for giving me this. Help me to understand it. Amen. Pray. It is essential. And some of these principles we've already covered before. You need to know what you're reading. Know your Bible. That was the whole sermon on the sword of the Spirit. Okay, where'd your Bible come from? What's the history of your Bible? What's the translation philosophy of your Bible? What is the strengths and weaknesses? doesn't mean to say that one Bible is necessarily superior to the other. You simply need to know what you're reading, not necessarily the Hebrew and the Greek, but just what is is the situation that your Bible presents to you? What are its circumstances? Know your Bible, the Protestant uh, quality and and, uh, value of sola scriptura. The Bible is sufficient to be its own interpreter. Stay within the boundaries of the Bible. doesn't mean that there aren't other sources that help you understand history and language and things like that, but ultimately the answers will be found in Scripture. There's no other authority that you need to have. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, study the context, but it's the whole Bible, only the Bible, and the Bible first. Make that your priority in your Bible study as you're breaking it down. Study with an attitude of openness. Now, you can be cynical and you can be skeptical, and the, the atheists and the anti-Christians are out there, and they read this text too, and they'll, be all, they'll have all sorts of conclusions and ideas, but if you truly want to understand it, have an open heart. Lord, you want me to understand what I'm reading. I'm going to have faith that this is the truth, and God will help you with that. And lastly, the Bible is the message of Jesus Christ. Everything that we study and read needs to be consistent with what the Bible teaches us about Jesus Christ. Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, you've read Moses, but you don't believe me. If you believed Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote about me. 
Everything in our Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is there to help us understand Christ, even the difficult passages, even the strange passages. Some way, somehow, they are there to help us know our Redeemer and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So always keep in mind that the Scripture, the ultimate lesson, must be consistent with Christ. But I'm going to even simplify this even more. Um, I know that we have lists and times, and again, there are many more uh, tips and things that we could apply, but if you just remember these two, that will be a hugely beneficial part of your journey of eating the bread of life. Always have the Holy Spirit guiding you through prayer and always be asking the question, is this consistent with the biblical picture of Jesus Christ? Those two guide rails, I think, will keep us on the right path of our Bible study. Now, um, I'm going to skip over uh, some passages. I wanted to give a couple of examples, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over. I was going to give a kind of simple example um, from the Psalms and then a more difficult example, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip over the Psalm 65. And you're all wondering, oh, but what is that? Isn't that interesting? Isn't that wonderful? No, it's not. We're skipping it. Oh, sometimes we have to do that. I apologize. Take out your Bibles with me. Deuteronomy 23. We're going to wrestle with a passage. I want to illustrate one way that we can partake of the bread of life together when we study our Bibles. We're going to look at a hard passage, a confusing passage. A passage is often misunderstood and can create a dilemma. And for this, again, for the sake of time, we're going to assume uh, that we've looked at certain historical and contextual uh, things so that we know what we're talking about. Deuteronomy, this is the time of Moses still. God has brought Israel out of Egypt, and He's trying to establish them as a nation. He's trying to teach them about the sanctuary, about worship, and about the plan of salvation. We know that. He's given them the sanctuary, He's given them the civil laws, and He's wanting them to understand what it means to be a family of God. And then we get to Deuteronomy 23, and we're presented with a challenge. My Bible has a title to it. It's not, a, it's not you know, scriptural. It's just what the editors wrote. And my title says this, Persons Excluded from the Assembly. And right from the beginning, it's like, well, wait a minute. This doesn't make sense. People aren't excluded from the assembly. Everything up until now has been about God bringing people together. We're going to now read about people excluded, and so we read together. Deuteronomy 23, verse 1. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. We're going to call them a eunuch, okay? That's essentially what they are. Uh, This was a practice common in the pagan world. If you were dedicated to your king and more more than likely dedicated to a female deity, often men, to show the level of their devotion to their female deity, would remove their ability to have intimacy with a human because they preferred to have spiritual intimacy with the female deity, okay? So, while it's not a practice common today, it was very common in the ancient world. They did a lot of grotesque things, and here here Moses, or the Lord through Moses says, anyone who's done that to their body, you're not going to be in the assembly of the Lord. It's strange, but it does cause somewhat of a dilemma. Verse 2, no one of illegitimate birth shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. Now we're talking about those who did not have a pure marriage uh, relationship and they had a child. So you are talking about several types of illegitimate birth, being born out of wedlock, being born of a harlot, or even if you were born where one parent was a believer and one parent was a Gentile, that would be an illegitimate birth. Well, that's interesting. Who was Ephraim and Manasseh's mommy? Do you remember that story? Joseph was in Egypt. 
Who did he marry again? Well, oh, that's right. He married an Egyptian. And not just any Egyptian, she was the daughter of a priest to the pagan gods of the Egyptians. So Ephraim and Manasseh would be, well, Mo- Moses, I got a question. You said 10th generation. Did we make it yet? Where are we at? Ninth? Are we at the 11th? But it can, it's a problem. What's going on here? Verse 3, no Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. There's a little additional word there. Ammonite and Moabites, these are cousins to the Jews, the, the sons of Lot through his daughters, Ammon and Moab, okay? They inherit territory east of the Jordan. And God gives some explanation for those. He says, they didn't meet you on the way, and they hired Balaam to curse you, so we don't like them, so they don't get to be part of the assembly of the Lord. Now, there's some problems here. First of all, so you've got eunuchs, those of illegitimate birth, and essentially foreigners. You're not going to be part of the community. Now, the problems with this, uh, and and by the way, we don't have time to go over over every single thing. We're going to hit some highlights here. First of all, just this idea of exclusion versus inclusion. If you've studied your Bible at all, if you've read, it's hard to jive that. Aren't we to bring the gospel to all nations? Aren't all invited to experience the grace of Jesus Christ? What is going on here? Was there a time when that truth didn't exist? Was this some type type of Old Testament reality that God changed His mind about and said, well, wait a minute, I've rethought it. I guess we'll let the, the foreigners be a part. This is not consistent with the majority of the other biblical texts that seems to say that God is inclusive of all people. And also, why these three things? I mean, they're, they, they can present some tough issues of purity and things like that, but these pagans, they were also sacrificing their children. They also practiced a, a, a enormous grotesque practices. There was rape and murder and, and child killing, they're okay to be in the assembly. But these ones aren't? What is going on? What, let's just, I tell you what, let's just not read Deuteronomy 23. God must have made a mistake. That's how a lot of people interact. And I want to say something else too. Now, you may not feel that these things are very uh, uh, relevant today, right? We don't practice you know, uh, male castration, Uh, you know, we don't do these things, we don't worry about this. But I tell you what, there are people who think that they've done things so grotesque in their past that God can't accept them. There are people who did not grow up in the church, and they feel like they're outsiders, and they don't feel like they belong in the church. And reading passages like this can create enormous confusion. Oh, I see that there are times when God says, if you've done something so terrible, you can't be part of the community. Oh, I see there are times when if you're, a, if you're an outsider and you don't understand what's going on, then you don't belong. So there are ways that the devil uses to apply these principles to people's struggles today. Lord, you, you can't accept me. I have done sin so terrible And I see in your scriptures that there are times when you can sin so badly that I'm no longer welcome in your community. So we ask the question, what is going on here? What can we do with a passage like this? In addition to that, we're faced with some very significant, what appears to be inconsistencies. Think about this. Are there examples of people who are eunuchs or of illegitimate birth or foreigners who God did use and were part of the community of faith. Now, because you haven't thought about this in advance, you may have to think about it, but the answer to that question is overwhelmingly yes. Just a couple of books after Deuteronomy, there's a book called Judges. And in the book of Judges, there is a judge by the name of Jephthah. And Jephthah is specifically said to be the son of a harlot of illegitimate birth, and yet God raises up Jephthah to not just be part of the assembly, but to lead the assembly. He becomes chief of the Israelites and delivers them from their enemies, and yet he was born of illegitimate birth. 
And this is long before 10 generations have gone, by the way, only about 300 years total of the period of the Judges. And he's like eight or nine in the Judges. Then right after the book of Judges, you guys know your, your Bible, what's the book after Judges? Say it with confidence. I, Ruth? Is it Ruth? Ruth! <laughs> Say it. Ruth. Who was Ruth? She's a Moabite. She's a Moabite. She marries Boaz. So now you have an, a foreigner, a, one of the, the people specifically mentioned by Moses in Deuteronomy 3, marries Boaz. They have a baby named Obed. And then Obed has Jesse. And after that comes King David. So Ruth becomes great-grandma to King David, which also puts her in the lineage of Christ. One of the forbidden people of Deuteronomy 23 clearly is used by God. And so you say, what? I don't, what, is, what are we talking about here? Then Isaiah 56. Let's not leave the eunuchs out. They've already suffered enough. Isaiah 56. God gives this amazing promise. We read about the Sabbath in Isaiah 56, and we refer to it from time to time. Isaiah 56 and verse 4, if you have your Bibles, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house. And within my walls, a memorial, a name better than that of sons of daughters. Which, by the way, he's speaking exactly to what the issue, if you don't have your ability to reproduce, you don't have sons and daughters. God says, I'm going to give you something better than that. I'm going to give you your name within my house, and I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. So God specifically says to you eunuchs, there's hope. I'm going to bring you in. You're going to be part of my community. And we sit here and we go, what about Deuteronomy 23? It doesn't make sense. But that's Old Testament. One more time. Get your book, uh, your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8. It's almost as though the Lord was specifically thinking of Deuteronomy 23 as the book of Acts is coming uh, into existence. Is there a eunuch in the book of Acts? There is. Acts chapter 8. Philip is ministering, and he comes across an Ethiopian eunuch. He's, he's got two strikes against him. He's both an outsider and he's a, a eunuch. And does, does Philip say, well, wait a minute. I wish I could help you, but you're out of luck. You're a eunuch. No, he preaches to him Christ, and this eunuch is baptized, which in the New Testament was their way of including them in the family of God. The Ethiopian eunuch is included. Go just two, book, two chapters later to Acts chapter 10. Now you have Peter going to a gentleman by the name of Cornelius. Now look at a couple of verses with me. Acts chapter 10 and verse 28. Acts chapter 10 and verse 28 if you have your Bibles. Peter said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner. What law is he referring to? What law was there that said foreigners cannot be part of the assembly? He's literally talking about Deuteronomy 23 here. You yourselves know how it's unlawful for us to have an association But he continues, yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Come back down, come down to verse 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. Now, this is not God changing, this is God changing man's perception. Okay, but he specifically mentions, you are a foreigner, my understanding is that we're not to associate together, but God has shown me I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But why did Moses write it then? He goes on to say, uh, verse 45, all the circumcised believers came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. In verse 48, he ordered them to be baptized in the name. They again are brought into fellowship. 
And then there's one more, Acts chapter 16. So we've talked about eunuchs, we've talked about foreigners. Well, what about those who don't have parents who had a legitimate marriage according to the standards? Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Paul also came to Derba, the Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was Greek. In specific language, all three of the exclusions of Deuteronomy 23 are challenged in the book of Acts, and they were in the Old Testament as well. What is going on? Do we exclude people or not? Why did God do this? What was happening? And so we go through the possibilities. What are some possible answers? And I put a question mark by this because all these answers are bad. These are not the right answers, and these are not the answers given by atheists and skeptics and those who don't want to believe. These are answers often given through, uh, you know, people wrestling with this and trying to come up with a reasonable answer. Okay? The, and the easiest one is people who just want to say it's wrong. Deuteron- Deuteronomy 23 is wrong and just ignore it. I don't want to talk about it. Let's just not, let's skip over chapter 20. We're going to go right to Deuteronomy 24 because Deuteronomy 23 is uncomfortable. It's wrong. I don't want to read it. Now, I don't think that is what God's plan is. Jesus said every word comes from the mouth of God. Others say it's wrong but it was necessary, and so you use kind of a situational ethic answer here. It was wrong then, and God knew it was wrong, but He allowed it. Just like He allowed racism, and He allowed slavery, and He allowed polygamy. He knew it was wrong, he, 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 but He allowed it because they weren't ready for the truth. They weren't, when they became more enlightened, then he, he was able to tell them the truth. But I'm telling you, friends, that is a slippery slope, and the end of that does not lead to good places. But yet, that is sometimes suggested. Others will say the text is wrong, but it's because uh, somewhere along the line someone uh, uh, didn't, didn't copy it right. Somewhere down along the line didn't get translated right. And so they, they, they continue to reject the text, but they look for other external reasons why that text might be wrong. Those are challenging and probably inappropriate ways of dealing with it. But then you get to the really scary ones. Okay, those who think it's right. Deuteronomy 23 is correct as is. All these other examples aside, it's correct as is. Now, if you believe that, next Sabbath when you come to church, we're going to check your birth certificate. We're going to need to see the passport, make sure you're okay. And if you're a gentleman, we're going to have a tent set up where we can make sure everything's intact and everything can come and we're going to be all right. You ready for that? But yet, in some ways, people will, they will read a text as problematic, and they won't wrestle with it at all. They'll just say, it's right. You have this with hellfire. You have this with hellfire. Oh, the Bible says that where the, the, the fire's not quenched and the worm does not die. So, eternal torment, torture forever. Yeah, but doesn't the Bible also say that the wages, it doesn't matter, eternal torment, billions and billions of years, leaps and flames of fire, torture and torment, that's God's plan. Yeah, but doesn't that seem, that's not consistent with Christ. It doesn't matter. And they will stand on that. We do this. Sometimes without realizing we do this. On hard passages, we want to be faithful. So we just say, it's right. It's right. Well, that's good that you want to believe it, but wrestle with it. You've got to break it down. Bread must be chewed. Bread must be broken. Bread must be digested. If you just swallow it whole, you're going to have a problem. So we need to think about it. It's correct... Now, this is kind of the cognate to number two. It's correct. It was correct at the time, but then God changed. He changed His mind. God learned. Again, you go down that route, you really put yourself over and above the text. You really even put yourself over and above God. And yet, this is very common in different applications of Bible study. And then this one is really, really tough. People say it is right as Moses wrote it, and Moses believed it, and Moses wrote it the way he wanted, but Moses was wrong. God's not wrong. Moses is wrong. This is called the higher critical method or the historical critical method, and I know we have major, major advocates of it within the Seventh-day Adventist church, 
I, I would just appeal to you, once you go down that road, you can say, well, Moses said that God flooded the earth but, and Moses believed it, but Moses was wrong. And the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross, but we know people don't really rise from the dead, so he probably passed out. So when John said that, John was mistaken. He, we know better. And it says he rose from, he didn't really rise from the dead. We know better. Do you see where I'm going with that? This is a very, very dangerous road. So all of these answers, which are common, and sometimes without even realizing it, we do this. But we need to understand that they leave us with some serious problems. These answers do not suffice to understanding this situation. Now, some tips. Avoid the Old Testament versus New Testament solution. A lot of people just say, oh, that's Old Testament. We don't do that sanctuary thing anymore, and we don't do circumcision. That's Old Testament. We now have Jesus in the New Testament. I've already pointed out to you, both Old and New Testament create inconsistencies with Deuteronomy 23, and the two Testaments don't differ. They wouldn't be testimonies then. They are two testaments of Jesus Christ. Paul told Timothy, you have known the Scriptures, Old Testament Scriptures, and they are able to make you wise to salvation in Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is an equal representation of the power and mercy of Jesus Christ as is the New Testament. So don't go down the path of that lazy, oh, it's just, that's just Old Testament. We're not doing a justice to it. Also, beware of upside-down pyramids. Have you heard this one before? You take a passage that is somewhat unique and narrow, and you make it your foundation, and then you pile up all the other evidence trying to balance it on that one text. People do this with alcohol. I'm using examples here. People do this with alcohol. There's a few passages in the Bible that you could possibly say are somewhat favorable to alcohol. Jesus turned water to wine. Hallelujah. Let's go to the bar. And Jesus told Timothy, drink a little wine for your your stomach problems. All right, bring the kegger on. Jesus, Paul says it's okay. And they build an upside because there's dozens upon dozens of other Bible passages that say, it's a problem. Don't do it. Noah drank and he ran around naked. Lot drank and he slept with his daughters. David tried to get Uriah drunk so he'd surrender his integrity. Solomon said, the wisest man ever, said, don't look at the wine. It's like a viper seeking to strike you. Throughout the New Testament, drunkenness is forbidden and sobriety is commanded. But if you want to hold, and by the way, I have relative people i love they love jesus christ but they no jesus water to wine let's let's drink and they build an upside down pyramid they say all those other things i've got to balance on that one passage all right that is not a stable way of studying our bibles we need to let the breadth of information on a singular topic have its foundation and then you put the other pieces in their place along the way all right by the way if you want to talk more about wine Uh, We'll talk about that later. Maybe a potluck. (laughs) And the last principle here. Always ask what did it mean before what does it mean. There was an original context. There was an original author with an original audience. And sometimes we are so unaware of the original context that we build our own modern context into it, and then we think we know what it means, and we have totally taken it away from its original meaning. Now, that doesn't mean God can't build contemporary meanings, but you have to at least start with what did it mean before we get to what does it mean. So, coming back then to the question, does Deuteronomy 23 teach that there are circumstances by which there are people who will never be allowed to experience the fellowship of the family and by extension not be able to experience salvation. Does it teach that? Does that is that consistent with other passages of the Bible? No. No. There is no evidence in the Bible that God permanently condemns people for a singular act of sin, no matter how grotesque, either on their part or on their parents' part throughout the biblical narrative. Even the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, friends, that is the sin of not allowing God to forgive you. 
all right? It is the sin of not allowing yourself to be forgiven. This is not the same thing. There is no evidence in any part of the rest of Scripture that God turns His back on someone because of a singular sinful incident or something in their parents' life that they had no control of that is completely devoid of the rest of the breath of Scripture that we have just reviewed. Let the eunuchs come. I'm going to raise up chiefs like Jephthah, and, I, and I'm going to bless Ruth. And all throughout the New Testament is completely inconsistent with that. So are you ready? I had to write this down because I couldn't memorize it. Therefore, the limited application of passages like Deuteronomy 23 and the overwhelming evidence of allowances, exceptions, and exemptions in both Old and New Testament to the expressed exclusions suggests that the injunctions against certain external realities are limited in nature and clearly are indicative of a narrow context whereby such circumstances indicate that outward expressions consistent with carnal or sinful practices at that time and in that moment also signified inward compromises to pagan or idolatrous beliefs inconsistent with the values of the community of God. Hallelujah. I should have been a lawyer, I tell you. Did you catch it? Let me summarize it for you. They were excluded because they were still sinners. In that moment, in that context, those narrow realities in that very beginnings of the beginning of the, 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 the creation of the nation of Israel, those actions and circumstances illustrated that they were still connected to their pagan ideas. There is no indication that this was a universal reality that selected just these three situations to say you are no longer part of the community. Look at what Revelation says. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates of the city. Blessed are those who have been forgiven, cleansed, restored, redeemed, brought into the family. You are welcome. Heaven is for you. But there are people who are excluded. Outside are the dogs or mongrels and the sorcerers and the immoral persons the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices lying. What's the difference? Those who are excluded are those who are not given to the mercy of God. They cling to their sins and therefore are excluded, not because God is shutting them out, but because they've chosen. They've chosen to love the darkness rather than the light. There will be people excluded but it's not because of a singular decision or a singular circumstance. The Bible clearly teaches it's because they've chosen it. They've chosen it because the Bible says, who is the one that condemns? Christ died. He died to show that He's not trying to, He's trying to save Christ Jesus is He who died, who is at the right hand of the God, who intercedes for us. Therefore, He's also able to save everyone forever, completely, total inclusion and restoration. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God. Everyone who desires an authentic relationship with God, whether it was in Deuteronomy 23 or in, Act, in the book of Acts or today in 2024, it has always been the same. You can have the promise of salvation if you are willing to let go of sin and accept the mercy of Jesus Christ since He always lives to make intercession for us, for them. Has it been a journey? Has it been a meal? Does it make sense, the process we go through? I realize I've, 
I've gone through this kind of briefly, but I wanted to take something we don't often look at and that can create problems because there are still problems today with sometimes the church or people making others feel excluded. But none who desire to walk with Jesus Christ and be part of the fellowship of His family are to be excluded. Jesus saves all. And He's always saved all. He always will be willing to save all. That has never, ever changed. Let's pray. Lord, we know that You have given us Your Word at great price, and it does contain passages that we sometimes don't understand. And sometimes it may take much longer to wrestle with some of Your truths. But Lord, You taught us that that is necessary for us to appreciate. We need to go by the sweat of our brow and work to understand and bring in the blessing that is Your meal. And then we need to take it inside. We need to consume it. We need to let it go deep. We don't want to be like that seed of faith that lands on the, uh, on the path. We don't want to have rocky soil as our heart. We don't want to have thorny soil. We want to have the right type of heart that as the Word comes into us, it can spring into life. Jeremiah said that when he ate the Word, it was to him joy and rejoicing. We want to rejoice as we learn more about you. And Lord, we live in a chaotic and difficult time. Help us, Father, to not neglect the bread of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, want, I know I went through a lot fast. If you want to talk more, let me know, because I'm going to be at potluck, and I'm going to be eating other bread. And I hope that you join us. God bless you. We'll see you soon.